Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We're certainly glad you're able to come out for this event and for this lecture, and we're certainly very, help, very happy to be welcoming Professor Dobsky. A bit of an introduction for you, both to IWP and to Professor Dobsky as well. Welcome to the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. We also offer the opportunity to take a single course without having to pay an entire semester's worth of, tu of tuition. One can also audit such a course as well. If you're interested in learning more about us, please feel free to speak to one of our staff at the conclusion of the event. Now, to introduce Professor Dobsky. Professor Bernard J. Dobsky is an associate professor of political science at Assumption College and is currently a visiting scholar for 2019-2020 at the Heritage Foundation. He is the co-editor of two volumes on Shakespeare's political thought. His articles and essays on the political wisdom of Thucydides, Xenophon, Shakespeare, and Mark Twain appear in the Review of Politics, Interpretation, Society, and Philosophy and Literature. He has also published on foreign policy, military strategy, sovereignty, and nationalism. Welcome, Professor Dobsky. Good afternoon, and thank you for that very kind introduction. I'm honored to be invited to the Institute of World Politics to discuss with you what Thucydides can teach us about the contemporary crisis in Hong Kong. I'm honored because the Institute of World Politics is not only staffed by experts in the fields of foreign policy, which is to say by those who have dedicated their lives to studying and understanding foreign affairs, to crafting policy, and to serving our country in theaters across the globe, but it also regularly brings to its students and faculty knowledgeable and influential actors in the realms of policy, practice, and ideas. So I consider myself privileged to be included among so many uh, impressive policymakers, military officers, and academics. After all, I cannot stand here in our nation's capital and lay claim to being an expert in Chinese politics or in the contemporary affairs of Hong Kong. So I'm mentioning this as something of a disclaimer, yet I plan to speak about this. What I can speak about with a fair degree of expertise is the enduring relevance of Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War to some of the most pressing crises of our time. <clears throat> Given the work's reputation for political wisdom, perhaps this is no small thing. It will surprise no one here uh, in this room that I should find Thucydides to be of enduring relevance. I've devoted the better part of my career to studying him. But I was relieved to see how seriously the Institute of World Politics takes the study of ideas, the study of morality, the study of ethics. Uh, perhaps most striking to me, more than the classes it offers on natural rights or ethics, even more than its wonderful mission statement, was the quote by Theodore Roosevelt in its educational philosophy. Quote, to educate a man in mind and not in morals is to educate a menace to society. That's exactly right. I mean, this seems to me so obvious as to not need stating. And yet there are so few institutions of higher education today that acknowledge the importance of giving their students a serious moral education. Or as is more likely, they confuse moral education <coughs> with indoctrination in the mono-ideological agitprop of left-wing academic progressivism. This is where I live, so I speak with some authority about this. They thus create generations of students who can only think in the Manichaean terms set by unhinged utopianism armed with his dangerous idealism, incapable of viewing the world with moral nuance, and unleavened by any dose of realism, the warriors of wokeness become precisely what Roosevelt feared, menaces to society. It thus falls to the few institutions who possess the foresight, the civic spiritedness, and the courage to provide the kind of education that our democratic republic will need if it's to persevere amidst so many challenges. It's my hope that the Institute of World Politics will continue to possess those virtues as it strives to advance its important educational imperatives. Okay, of course, one of the greatest challenges that America faces today is that posed by China's incredibly rapid economic, technological, and military growth. Though the emergence of China as a major player in Asian and global politics is hardly news, we find ourselves increasingly focused on China because of contemporary developments in Hong Kong, right? Uh, 
ever since authorities in China passed a bill earlier this year that would allow them to extradite suspected criminals from Hong Kong, right, a bill that was occasioned by a confession of a Hong Konger that he'd killed his girlfriend in Taiwan, citizens in Hong Kong marched in protest. Now, these protests, which began in March and started out rather small, were led by those who feared that the bill would allow China to detain political dissidents and human rights advocates in Hong Kong, much as it does on the mainland. Of course, over the spring and summer, these protests swelled, with numbers reaching as high as one to two million by the protesters' own assessments, especially as police in Hong Kong uh, increasingly responded to protesters with violence. The aggressive response to these protests by Hong Kong authorities, whether it was through tear gas, smoke grenades, batons, rubber bullets, water cannons, you name it, led to the protesters issuing their five demands, one of which was recently, uh, was recently granted, so the full withdrawal of the extradition bill. While police brutality has been a major concern for the protesters, the Hong Kong police, along with their Beijing sympathizers and pro-China thugs, don't enjoy a monopoly on the violence. The protesters themselves have increasingly resisted efforts by the police to disband protesters with vandalism and violence of their own, much of it rather creative. Of course, this is not violence for the sake of violence. After all, what is a free people to do against the armed might of the Chinese state? Denied legal right to assemble and equipped with little more than masks and umbrellas. Given the stakes involved and the incredibly long odds against them, one might well wonder if the, pro uh, the protesters aren't angling for something big, like genuine separation from the mainland. But as again many have emphasized, the protesters in Hong Kong are not pursuing independence from China. They're not calling into question the policy of one country, two systems. They don't want to leave China, it seems. They just don't want to lose what they have in Hong Kong, right? They want to preserve OCTS. They just don't want to lose the freedoms they enjoy under their capitalist system. And so it's to achieve this end, to preserve this end, that the protesters have reached out to American diplomats and policymakers to draw them into support of their cause. We know much of this. Now, it doesn't take much to understand why they would appeal to American policymakers, right? We're powerful. China is our biggest uh, economic competitor. We're frequently at odds with this state over its well-documented treaty violations and human rights abuses. But America also represents a beacon of freedom, democracy, and opportunity. It's the country where individual flourishing, the free development of natural capacities and talent is most encouraged. And so the Hong Kongers, clinging desperately to their freedoms, their dreams of autonomy, the rights to private property in the face of overwhelming opposition, can only hope to succeed by appealing to the hearts of the American public and their elected representatives. Of course, when American lawmakers like Nancy Pelosi publicly meet with the protesters, when our Vice President Pence says, quote, we stand with you, we are inspired by you, unquote, when Senator Marco Rubio announces that, quote, preserving Hong Kong's autonomy should be a priority of the United States, unquote, and when legislation like the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act appears to enjoy bipartisan backing in Congress, then it seems like the efforts of the protesters have succeeded. Given such public endorsement by American leaders, the sharply worded reactions that China's foreign ministry quickly issued, casting the protests as the work of foreign powers doomed to failure, were entirely predictable. Now, it's difficult to imagine that President Trump would refuse any leverage that the protests in Hong Kong might afford him in many of his economic trade negotiations with China. But it's equally likely that he would veto any bill that would risk uh, or put in peril uh, those negotiations. By all accounts, both sides appear to want to avoid unnecessary military conflict. That's a good thing. Nevertheless, the fact that such a relatively minor flashpoint could escalate tensions between the two greatest powers on the globe is precisely the dangerous possibility at the heart of Graham Allison's 2017 work, Destined for War. Allison's book, full title of which, Destined for War, Can America and China Escape Thucydides' Trap, rapidly became an influential statement on the challenge that a rising China posed to the international order created and led by the U.S. 
Uh, many of you probably know who Allison is, right? He needs no introduction, founding dean of the Harvard Kennedy School, former assistant secretary of defense, a kind of academic superstar, no stranger to the spotlight, found himself called to the White House to offer briefings on this latest work on American and Chinese relations to help his audience understand the dangers that China's rapid growth posed to both countries, Allison's book draws on the classic statement of great power war, right? Thucydides' history. He does so to argue that, quote, the structural stress caused when a rising power threatens to upend a ruling one makes even ordinary flashpoints likely to trigger large-scale conflict. So the inability of, say, ancient Athens and Sparta to peacefully navigate the risks posed by Athens' rise <clears throat> led to a 27-year war that Thucydides himself called the greatest motion of all time. If we are to avoid the human catastrophe of such a war, Allison argues that America must find a way to accommodate the economic, military, and political ascendance of China. Now... Allison certainly seems right about the growth of China. That's hard to dispute. And I think he's right to look to Thucydides for help in understanding our dilemma. But Allison reduces Thucydides' work to an instrument of realpolitik. Now, I think turning Thucydides' massive and magisterial account of the war between Athens and Sparta into some simple commonplace about the role of power in politics, an insight that's been with man since the dawn of political communities fails to do justice to the graceful wisdom embodied in the history. <coughs> Using Thucydides' account of the siege of Plataea as a guide to China's contemporary treatment of Hong Kong, I think we can see another deeper and richer lesson in Thucydides' history, one that must not be forgotten by those who wish, in the face of Chinese authoritarianism, to preserve the fragile but precious gift of freedom at the heart of Western political life. Let's return to Allison for a second. <clears throat> what is it that he gets wrong about Thucydides that's so important? Again, he's right to note that the rise of Athens in the 5th century BC put a lot of stress on the international system that had been created and defended by Sparta and her allies. But see, Allison understands the issue to be one of power simply. And so he treats Athens and China as interchangeable units, both are rising powers that threaten an international order that's not of their making. But Thucydides makes it abundantly clear that the problem the Athenians posed wasn't just about an increase in their power. Huh? For the Greeks, it was the peculiar nature of Athenian power that proved so threatening to the neighbors in the Mediterranean. As Thucydides tells us in Book 1, and I apologize if the, the map isn't particularly clear. But as he tells us in the book one of in book one of his history, the power that made Athens so terrifying to others first bursts on the scene at the Battle of Salamis in 480 BC. There, the naval victory that the Athenians led over the far more numerous and vastly richer uh, uh, forces. Salamis, uh, Salamis is right there, by the way. Straits of Salamis, you can see. The, vi the naval victory that the Athenians led over the far more numerous and vastly richer Persian forces, a victory that they achieved through their own bravery, daring, and foresight, introduced the Athenians to the beauty and the power of raw, unadorned, unassisted human nature. Now, what do I mean by that? A little bit of background. To produce this incredible victory, the Athenians had to send all of their women and children, all of their elderly, into hiding and place all of the able-bodied adult males of their city into ships, the rich and poor alike, and stake everything on a single battle in the Straits of Salamis. With about 34,000 men and their roughly 200 triremes, they quite literally became a city afloat. The revolutionary nature of this step, which required leaving behind their ancestral graves, their sacred olive groves, the temples of their gods, cannot be overstated. To save their city and their freedom, the Athenians made the unprecedented decision to abandon their city and all it represented, its norms, its customs, its laws, its gods, abandon them quite literally to the barbarians. The nearly miraculous victory at Salamis that resulted thus not only heralded the end of the Persian threat in Greece, 
but exposed the Athenians and their now shocked and terrified neighbors to the intoxicating possibilities of what human beings could do for themselves on their own if they only possessed sufficient daring, intelligence, and most importantly, a commitment to their freedom. The vibrant democracy and the amazingly robust intellectual life that flourished in Athens over the next 150 years and which came to define life in the West for two and a half millennia was born from this yearning for a kind of a wholeness, a kind of natural self-sufficiency, a freedom that could only be enjoyed if, the, if we're somehow liberated from the constraints imposed on us by, by conventions or by social, familial, and political life. They're somehow liberated or loosened or relaxed. For Athens, you see, freedom and power go together. The amazing self-sufficiency, the daring, the energy, the versatility originally discovered by the Athenians in the Straits of Salamis is perhaps best captured in a speech by one of their enemies, delivered by the Corinthians to the Sparta on the eve of the Peloponnesian War. Drawing a contrast between the Spartan manners and the Athenian manners, the Corinthians astutely note that unlike the Spartans, the Athenians, quote, are addicted to innovation. Their designs are characterized by swiftness alike in conception and execution. They're adventurous beyond their power and daring beyond their judgment. Swift to follow up a success and slow to recoil from a reverse, they toil on in trouble and danger all the days of their lives. To describe their character in a word, one might truly say that they were born into the world to take no rest themselves and to give none to others. Now, no sooner are these words spoken, you can imagine like a cartoon bubble, right? That the words are just hanging out there. No sooner are they spoken than some of the Athenian envoys, who just so happen to be in Sparta on other business, that is, not on state-related business concerning matters of peace and war. These guys show up and volunteer to speak to the uh, Spartan assembly and offer a defense of their city's imperial sway. Now, the impromptu speech that follows is, is a, a tour de force of rhetoric. It's stunningly impressive, and all the more so for being delivered essentially by private individuals and off the cuff. And in its remarkably candid defense of Athenian Empire and in their worthiness to claim dominion over their fellow Greeks, the envoys confirm the portrait of themselves that the Corinthians had just sketched of them minutes before. They are the embodiment of daring, self-sufficiency, initiative, and self-confidence. Now, all of this versatility, this dexterity, this frenetic dynamism is precisely the result of the Athenians' discovery of a nature that holds out the promise of a good that cannot be reduced to, that cannot be identifiable with one's own. Put differently, the Athenians begin to measure themselves against the standard of the human good that's independent of Athens, even independent of Greece. They begin to measure themselves in their own self-understanding against the standard of the good that applies to all human beings as such. Now, this is an important distinction because it's, it's what uh, divides or separates the Athenians from the Spartans and, as we'll see, from their allies, the Thebans. The Athenians' discovery of a human nature allows them to think in terms of goods that are applicable to all human beings and in which all human beings can participate wherever they might be found. Athenian reflection on what constitutes their own good thus becomes open to a universalistic and not a particularistic understanding of human goods. Now, I'm going on at pains to, point, uh, to paint this portrait of the Athenians because Allison completely glosses over this aspect of the Athenian character. That's why he can treat as interchangeable the Athenians with a Chinese uh, national identity that seems every bit its opposite. According to the portrait uh, of the Chinese character that Allison sketches in chapter six and seven of his book, China understands itself to embody the peak of human excellence. But it's not an excellence in, any, uh, in which anyone who isn't Chinese can participate. Quote, at the core of its national goals, Allison writes, is a civilizational creed that sees China as the center of the universe, unquote. One whose centripetal force pulls all other nations and cultures into its orbit. 
And calling itself the Middle Kingdom, China presents itself as, quote, all that lies between heaven and earth. In Allison's analysis, this means that all other countries, to the extent that they're not Chinese, are necessarily inferior and must kowtow to China out of respect for her self-evident superiority. While her superiority entitles her to deference and respect from the rest of the world, it doesn't translate into a universal mission to make the world Chinese. Sorry, but that blessing is out of reach for those not lucky enough to have been born Chinese or to share in the manners and customs that define the Chinese way of life. This means, then, contrary to the Athenians, that China understands the human good in terms of what is its own. Its rejection of a Western-style universal civilization is perfectly in keeping with its view of its own civilization and its own, quote, self-referential body of philosophical thought, unquote, as the peaks of human culture. This is Allison's presentation of the Chinese. I don't mean to defend it. I only stress these aspects of such a self-understanding to show that in its hierarchical view of international and domestic relations, in its particularistic view of the human good, China, as, as Allison presents it, appears more like the Persians as we find them described in Herodotus, or the Spartans and the Thebans as we find them in Thucydides. Now these similarities are strengthened when we take into account the Chinese preference for order over liberty, for hierarchy over democracy, for stability over change, and for long-term solutions, which require patience and eschew force, over the pursuit of short-term goals that often require risky military action. A people defined by these characteristics are not Thucydides Athenians. Now, if this is right, if China's political character resembles more of ancient Sparta or Thebes than Athens, then it means that the Chinese might also be particularly prone to what Thucydides identifies as the Spartan hypocrisy, which is what? Identifying justice with what serves her self-interest. Identifying justice with what serves her self-interest. As we'll see, this is critical. For now, it's worth stating that Allison's misidentification of Athens means he fails to grasp what is fully at stake in the contest between America and China. As such, he advocates a policy of more or less accommodation with China that puts at risk the gift of political, moral, and intellectual freedom that we inherited from ancient Athens, and that's defined the West for the better part of two millennia. Against Allison's advice of accommodation, I posit the suggestions offered by David Goldman, both in his Claremont Review of Allison's uh, book back in 2017 and in a recent lecture he delivered at the Heritage Foundation in 2019. Goldman argues against trying to stop the Chinese economic juggernaut from competing with America in areas critical to national security and economic supremacy. Don't try it. It won't work. Don't try and stop them. Instead, outproduce them. Build better products, argues Goldman. In other words, as he states so nicely, China can indeed innovate, but America can innovate better, as it's shown in the past, especially under administrations by the, the, the JF, uh, John F. Kennedy's administration or the Reagan administration. This is key for Goldman. Recover those strategies that worked for us during the Cold War. In that case, the operational imperative is what? Innovate, invent, produce, especially in areas like quantum computing and semiconductors. Economic offense, not economic defense, that's the order of the day. Now, one of the things that Goldman uh, emphasizes, for those of you who aren't, weren't familiar with his argument, uh, is he says, look, uh, the, 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 the administrations that he singles out and identifies as being so successful, what they did that was, was different was that they encouraged and funded a network of corporate laboratories, defense agencies that fund basic research, national laboratories and universities 
that helped produce those technological advancements which forced the Soviets eventually to admit basically defeat, that they would never be able to catch up to us uh, you know, around the 1980s. Uh, I should also note, in addition, this Goldman encourages the U.S. to attract Chinese talent to America's shores to produce this brain drain that he, he argues will hamper Chinese innovation. Now, Goldman's advice for the recreation of these networks and for the massive public, and that's really important to know, the massive public subsidies that's going to be required and the private reinvestment in research and development that all of this entails, that's a tall order given how far behind we are already and how late in the day it is. But his advice, contra Allison, has the advantage of being consistent with the distinctive spirit of the West, a view which is supported by no less an authority than Thucydides. In short, I think a proper reading of Thucydides shows why Goldman, and not Allison, is right. To his credit, Allison senses the wisdom in Thucydides' history. He's right to note in his closing chapter that if we hope to be statesmen who are skillful enough, and I'm quoting him, skillful enough to secure their nation's vital interests without stumbling to war, then we will find no better place to start than in rereading Thucydides. Well, okay, yeah, but rereading isn't enough. You gotta get them right. You gotta respect the text. You can't commit the same mistake that Allison does in approaching it with so much carelessness. If, if, look, I can't imagine that, that Allison would ever allow his students to approach a study of China or American foreign policy with the same laxity and disregard to detail that characterizes his own treatment of Thucydides. But hey, what can I say? He's a dean at Harvard. Now, it might seem like I'm picking on Allison. I'm sure he can handle it. Uh, but I should note that I have a number of colleagues in the academy who commit the same fault, right? They get all excited by developments in contemporary politics, and they, they run off to some of the history's more famous passages in the hopes that they can draw lessons about practical politics from the deep well of Thucydides and wisdom. And so they dash off columns about how a nation of 1.4 billion crushing resistance from a country of only 7 million souls calls to mind the Melian Dialogue. You guys ever hear this Melian Dialogue? No? Some of you maybe? Yeah, good, good. In this story, in this account of, of events, the Chinese are forced to stand in for the Athenians again. And they try to jam down the throats of the poor little Melians, here the Hong Kongers, right? The brutal fact that recourse to law and justice only works among equals and powers. When there's inequality in power, what's the rule? The strong do what they can, and the weak suffer what they must. Ooh chilling. But that's the lesson that people seem to take away from this reading of the Melian Dialogue. That the, that the population on the tiny island of Milos gets annihilated by an Athenian force utterly deaf to appeals to mercy law and the gods suggests a very grim outcome awaits the Hong Kongers. But once again, we're in the area of facile readings of an important text. In the first place, if you're paying attention at home, folks, the Athenians are not defenders of the thesis that might makes right that so many take them to be. For not only are they preferring here dialogue to force, but they appeal to their own nobility. Suggest that they, unlike their enemies, the Spartans, are above mere considerations of power and interests. Moreover, to an audience governed by conventional views on piety and moral virtue, they candidly insist on the unconventional view that the rule of men and gods is really all about amoral realpolitik. Now think about that for a second. Taking this strategy with the Melians, to try and convince the Melians, is like trying to win over children who still believe in Santa Claus by insisting that Jeff Bezos and Amazon, not Rudolph, brings their presents on Christmas morning. For a people as rhetorically savvy as the Athenians, this move is beyond self-defeating. It's positively stupid that they insist on using it anyway suggests that they're more interested in disclosing to the Melians the true basis of their rule over them, not in coolly pursuing calculated benefits. This is not Machiavelli, ladies and gentlemen. For the, these Athenians, it's not might that makes right, but right that they hope makes might. If the infamous Melian dialogue is not an appropriate analogy for the contemporary crisis, then what is? Uh, well, I submit, as you've already heard, right, that the, the episode from Thucydides' text 
which offers the greatest possible insight into contemporary developments in Hong Kong, is the siege of Plataea. Why is that? Uh, you can see here. Sorry, let me just uh, step out here. You can see way down here, it's Athens, right? And this is the Corinthian Gulf. Yay, okay, down here we got the Peloponnesus and Sparta. Up here is Thebes, right? Right here is Plataea. This is about eight miles difference. This is almost 40 miles. <clears throat> so why is the siege of Plataea so important? Allison, again, argues or is concerned with those seemingly normal flashpoints that in the context of great power tensions could trigger a massive war. If that's his concern, this is the place for us to start. Why? Though both the Spartans and Athenians had decided on war by the end of 432, open hostilities had not yet begun, right? This wasn't a shooting war yet. That ends in 431, when the Thebans assault Plataea. As you can see, Plataea, located northwest of Athens, had long been an ally of this city, right? She was an, about a centuries-old ally of Athens. But originally... She had been settled by the Boeotians, right? She was a Boeotian in terms of her stock. That whole region around Thebes is, is Boeotian. So she had been settled ultimately by colonists from Thebes. Now, while she shared an ethnic identity with the Thebans, the Plataeans, much like the Hong Kongers with respect to the Chinese, sought to distance themselves from that hegemonic control exercised by their ethnic kin. And in both cases, the Plataeans and the Hong Kongers spent at least a century within the orbit of foreign cultures that emphasized freedom, equality, dynamism, and individuality. All right, so what are the Thebans up to in 431? They want to restore this long-lost sheep to their flock. And having determined that war between Athens was going to break out any day, they said, let's attack Plataea while there's still peace and before Plataea has a reason to be on her guard. The assault of a small Theban force on this city was thus the match that lit the flames of a nearly 30-year war between Athens and Sparta. Now, this assault on Plataea is really quite nasty. It's really duplicitous. First of all, they're relying on Plataean traders. They attack at night against an unsuspecting city at a time of nominal peace. Now, initially, they're alarmed, the Plataeans, as you might imagine, right? They're, they're alarmed at the sight of armed Thebans in their midst in the middle of the night. So the first thing they do is they go, okay, we're going to surrender our city to Thebes. We're going to return ourselves to the, the, the fold of our ethnic kin, the Boeotians. But then they realize how small the number was of the invading force and very secretly and quickly organized a resistance that ended up killing or capturing almost all of the 300 invaders. Now, there were Theban enforcements on their way that had been delayed by that night's rain. So the very next day, what do the Plataeans do? They say, listen, <clears throat> you guys come any closer, and we're going to kill everybody here. So the Thebans hold off. They use this delay to contact their allies uh, in Athens, asking for help. They bring within the city walls all of those who lived outside. And then once the Thebans removed themselves from the territory, you know what the Plataeans did? They promptly killed all of their hostages. Now, in learning this news, the Athenians, who, by the way, didn't want the prisoners harmed, their, their original advice was, don't touch a hair on their head. They sent a garrison to the city. They took all of the women and children and the elderly from Plataea and moved them to Athens, and then rounded up all of the Boeotians who lived in their territory. All right, that's the opening salvo. The next year was pretty quiet, but year three, the Spartans are hot, and their Theban allies are furious. They want revenge. And so they decide, let's lay siege to Plataea. And after some initial negotiations, which of course failed, decided to invest the city completely. This began a two-year effort to lay siege to the city that ultimately resulted in its destruction and the unjust and inglorious execution of all of those within its walls. I want to emphasize two elements about this siege that I think is relevant to today's events in Hong Kong. <clears throat> the first 
thing I want to emphasize concerns the remarkable ingenuity and resilience of the Plataeans and the Athenians who were sent to help them. So Athens sent about a, a garrison of about 80 people who are still in, in Plataea with them. Thucydides' account of this Spartan siege and the Theban effort to topple Plataea is really heart pounding. I recommend reading it if you have the time. See, whatever the Spartans threw at the Plataeans, the Plataeans were capable of anticipating and deflecting. So we have here, right, this is a, 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 a makes it look like the, it's like a medieval drawing of Plataea. I mean, the city did not look like this in, in 431 or 428 BC, right? But, but it's the best image I could come up with that might help it, give you a sense as to what is going on in the siege. The Spartans begin by building up a mound against the wall of the city. What do the Plataeans do? They build a counter wall. Right? They built a counter wall that allowed them to carry, the, that abutted this wall here, and they took mud out. Right? So the, the wall could never ascend, the mound could never ascend, so they kept taking the mud away. The Spartans couldn't figure out what was going on here. So once they do, what do they do? They build a new mound to frustrate that. So what do the Plataeans do? They build a, they, they tunnel under the wall, they start pulling it away. Right? Same thing happened. Boy, these Spartans are, are slow to, to, to catch on, right? So they tunnel under the city. They carry away the dirt from below. Finally, the Spartans said, okay, you know, we'll, we'll try fire, right? Well, that didn't work because they had two walls. Set, the the Plataeans had built two walls here to separate it and were able to put it out. And then they say, hey, you know what? We're going to use some siege engines. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to ram the walls down. And what are the, the Plataeans come up with these very ingenious uh, uh, beams connected to, to chains that drop down and destroy the siege works. Okay, so say, you know, the Spartans then try, we're going to try and set fire to the city again. Now this time the Plataeans got lucky, there was a big rainstorm. Oh, whew. okay, so the Spartans say, we're going to use signal fires to call Thebes for more allies. What do the Plataeans do? Light a bunch of signal fires of their own to confuse the message. Finally, the Spartans say, forget it. We're going to abandon this and we're going to circumvallate the city with three walls of circumvallation. What do the Plataeans do? They use those walls to design escape ladders that will allow about half of the city to break out and escape. The resiliency and creativity of the Plataeans finds its modern analog in today's Hong Kong protesters. Whether it's the use of social media like Twitter, Telegraph, Twitch, Tinder, WhatsApp, Facebook, Pokemon Go. They're using Pokemon Go to... to to uh, like arrange and coordinate protests or to publicize their cause to the world, whether it's the use of face masks and umbrellas to frustrate China's efforts to identify or deliberately target protesters, whether it's the underground networks of doctors and nurses to treat wounded protesters, or pro bono legal services by lawyers, or journalists independently documenting the resistance, or crowdfunding efforts to defray medical and legal bills of the protesters, or to support their need to go out and buy gas masks, goggles, hard hats. All of this suggests that Hong Kong protesters continue to demonstrate the fluidity, daring, and intelligence that's necessary to preserve their freedom. That's the first thing I wanted to emphasize. The second concerns the surrender of the city and the speeches that decide the fate of the unhappy Plataeans. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, about 428, the, uh, a, group of, uh, a group of the city's defenders escape in an, in an insanely daring nighttime attempt. The few forces that remained behind to defend the city were no match for Sparta and her Theban allies. So unable to repel the, the invaders, the starving defenders, having completely run out of provisions, surrendered their city on the grounds that they would receive a fair trial by the Spartans. They did not get it. Instead, they were forced to state under pain of oath, I'm sorry, under pain of death, what services they performed for Sparta during the current war. In other words, as you come forward, tell us what you did to help Sparta during this war. If the answer is nothing, death, right? Which is, of course, the answer everyone's going to have to give. Knowing that this was a bait and switch aimed at placating Sparta's Theban allies, the Plataeans appealed to the Spartans' sense of justice, their sense of fair play, their sense of honorable reputation. They appealed to the heroic deeds they performed against the Persian in the second Persian invasion. They reminded the Spartans that it was their own inaction in a time of their emergency that forced the Plataeans to ally with the Athenians. I mean, originally the Plataeans went to the Spartans for help, and the Spartans said, now nah, go ally with Athens. 
a partnership that the Plataeans cannot now disregard honorably or safely. Remember, Athens has their children, their women, their elderly. And they appealed to the gods and graves of those Spartans who died at Plataea, which was the site of the final battle of the Persian War, in which uh, the graves of which the Plataeans had maintained the last 50 years. Any sentient being in Thucydides' audience reading or watching the Plataeans reluctantly acknowledge and closing that the end of their speech likely meant the end of their lives has to admit that this is a pitiful speech. Needless to say, it falls on deaf ears. Before the Spartans can respond, their hated enemies, the Thebans, deliver a speech of their own, one that again emphasized shared ethnicity and which identifies the good of Thebes with the good of all of Greece. They hypocritically defend their own prior bad actions during the Persian War. They, they cited with the Persians, the Thebans did. It's dirty punks. <laughs> They, de they defended their own prior bad actions by recourse to necessity while denying the Plataeans that same defense. They accused the Plataeans of mistreating their captured prisoners, which seems fair, except for the fact that these men were captured conspiring to destroy the city. In short, their speech is a testament to the power of double standard. What's permissible for us cannot be allowed to you. Well, shocker, the Spartans agree with the Thebans. They execute the remaining defenders, raise the city to the ground, and turn it over to the Thebans to colonize because they wanted, in Thucydides' words, to please the Thebans who were thought to be useful in the war at that moment raging. And so they confirm what the Potans themselves had feared, that if the Spartans take, quote, your own immediate interest and Theban animosity as the test of justice, you will prove yourselves to be the servants of expediency rather than judges of right, unquote. But really, what else is to be expected of a regime that consistently identifies the good with its own? Now, if I'm right to draw a parallel between this siege and the current crisis in Hong Kong, then it doesn't seem there are a lot of positives that are to be drawn for the U.S. or for the protesters. And not simply because China is only 27 years away from being legally free to do what it wants with Hong Kong. But I think there are a couple of lessons, and let me try and spell those out right now. <clears throat> the first concerns the importance of the distribution of power. In the case of Plataea, Sparta and Thebes have it. Plataea doesn't. Without any serious help from the Athenians, who are, you know, as we saw earlier in the map, they're about 40 miles away as opposed to eight from Thebes. Plataeans can't hope to defeat Spartans, and they have no realistic hope of eliminating the real threat in their neighborhood, the Thebans. So if the law of the land, ladies and gentlemen, is realpolitik, then Hong Kong, I'm afraid, has slim hopes for freedom. Now, we might be wondering why the Athenians, who are their allies, did so little to help them out. Why not come to their aid? Um, well, I think the answer is simple. Right, one, Athens was looking elsewhere at that time. During the siege, they were pursuing efforts in Thrace to expand their empire and defend it there, number one. Number two, they, their, their strategy was never engage the Spartans where the Spartans were strong. Always fight when, when we were at our best, and that usually meant maritime conf, uh, uh, conflicts or contests. Now, don't get me wrong, I think one should protect one's allies and keep one's word. Obviously, an Athenian friend in Boeotia would be nice for the Athenians, but at what price do you purchase that friend? Besides, Plataea was a small town, wasn't particularly strong, wasn't particularly wealthy. So what's the loss here? Not defending Plataea or not expending a great deal to defend Plataea seemed like sound Athenian advice. And it might be sound advice for us to follow. All right, so Athens loses Plataea. So what? <clears throat> Even so, she was still in a position to declare victory just a few years later, right? Uh, uh, around four, four, uh, four, sorry, 421, uh, they had captured about 120 Spartiates at the island of, of Sphacteria, and Sparta sued for peace which means that the loss of Plataea had no real impact on the actual outcome of their war. So losing Hong Kong, if we've ever had it to begin with, right? and it seems like a foregone conclusion anyway, given geography, 
given 2027, that's not going to decisively alter the strategic options available to either the U.S. or to China. Better to play the long game, or like Athens, who, as I mentioned, looked to Thrace while the Spartans besieged Plataea, find other theaters where we might serve our interests. If we keep an eye on anything, maybe we keep an eye on Taiwan. Hmm? I mean, it's of clearly greater strategic importance than Hong Kong. It's clearly there, uh, one country, two systems is not applicable and not welcome. Or maybe we should be even looking broader afield, especially if David Goldman is right. And the real key to American success lies not in fomenting rebel provinces in China, but in achieving supremacy in manufacturing and technology. One, one, more other, one, one other thing I want to mention before I, I turn to, the, to the, my closing comments, and that is, you know, it's also helpful when we learn to think about the lessons to be drawn from thinking about Plataea to keep in mind the importance of knowing who your enemies are. I mean, who knowing who they really are. I mean, if it's the case that the Chinese are like the Spartans and the Thebans and that they identify what is just with what serves their interests, then that means you have to be very careful in the kind of agreements you make with them and certainly in verifying, trusting and verifying how they live up to those agreements. You see, it was the, there were certain Plataeans who, who didn't know this about the Spartans, and they chose not to escape. They thought it was too risky. Well, they paid for it with their lives and the loss of their city. So it's, it's critical to, to keep in mind and not let false hope cloud one's judgment, you know, in, in the hope that you might find a better alternative elsewhere. While the eventual outcome in Plataea was never really in doubt, the besieged, I mean, here's another important lesson to keep in mind, the besieged were, through their ingenious and daring responses to Spartan provocations, able to prolong the investment of their city. That significantly raised the costs for the Spartans. We saw again and again the Spartans had to resort to other things, and they had to, to spend money that Sparta did not have a lot of money. They had to spend money they didn't have to keep that resistance up. And that's not an insignificant point. If the Plataeans had been better provisioned, they could have held out longer and drained Sparta even more. What's the lesson here? Well, I mean, we're not going to drain China dry, financially speaking, and basically bottomless treasury, okay? That's not the issue. But if, if one can sustain the protesters' incredible energies, and if one can keep them from being too violent, and destroying too much property, it's possible to force China to exert more of its political energies uh, than it had otherwise planned to. And let's face it, if it's going to get Hong Kong sooner or later, you might as well raise the cost of its getting Hong Kong sooner or later, right? Constricting or limiting or making their movements within their own hemisphere more expensive certainly won't hurt us. Now, <clears throat> I'm almost done, so thanks for bearing with me. I'm almost done. It's possible, after hearing all of this, hearing all about Thucydides, that you could say, well, this is great, but I got this from MSNBC, or I got this from the Claremont Review of Books, I got this from Wall Street Journal, or The Economist, or whatever. I don't need Thucydides for that. Even if I were to concede that broader point, and I wouldn't, but even if I were, there remains this other issue. The issue of the intelligence, the daring, and the unrivaled commitment to freedom that the Plataeans and Athenians repeatedly displayed throughout the siege, especially in that moonlight escape of just over 200 of the city's defenders. And again, that's we got the artist's rendering of what happened. It looks like a medieval town here, of course, but let's suspend our disbelief for a second. This escape, conducted on a winter night amidst the rain and the snow, required the escapees to cross three separate lines of circumvallation. The first was a ditch. Right here, an outer ditch in between the, the wall of the Plataeans and the wall of the Spartans. Then you have the Spartan fortifications, which they, they had to, the Plataeans had to design ladders that were long enough to reach the top of the wall and climb atop them. Once up there, seize control of the Spartan towers. Right? So, so as to protect the other 200 people clambering over the wall. Once they had done that, they had to descend down the other side and cross a final outer ditch, all before marching 40 miles to Athens, and all, of course, without getting killed by the hundreds of Peloponnesians who were literally right below them. 
Of the 200 men, uh, of the 220 men who attempted this brazen escape, eight turned back. The remaining 212 all made it alive to Athens. What does this tell us? It's true that those who defended the city lacked the materiel, the manpower, and the money of their enemies. And so they were decidedly less powerful in that respect. But they possessed a cunning and an intelligence and a raw daring that allowed them to generate the kind of power whose genesis we saw in the victory at Salamis. It was that daring, that intelligence at Plataea that allowed them to master their natural surroundings, to employ the mathematic and scientific knowledge needed to create the tools for their escape, and to master the psychology that made escape a reality. Remember, 200 escaped and were saved, but that guaranteed that anyone who remained behind was going to die. Those who were left behind weren't abandoned. They chose to stay. They lacked the commitment to freedom to do what needed to be done and they paid for it. The kind of daring, intelligence, and commitment to freedom displayed at Salamis and again at Plataea serves, I think we, we call it in modern military parlance, as a force multiplier. Taken together, they can generate the power that one lacks in arms or men or money, offsetting one's richer, more numerous enemies. I stress in closing that I don't think the protesters in Hong Kong can adopt this strategy out of a realistic hope for victory. The best I think they can hope for is to delay and defer, stretch out the contest as long as possible in the hopes that additional variables might come into play that could ultimately fall into their favor. If China is like Sparta and, and Thebes, uh, the Hong Konger should be under no illusions about the character of the opponent they're facing. I do think, however, that the lessons afforded by this siege can inspire American efforts to respond meaningfully to the challenge posed by an ascendant China. In other words, the example of those Plataeans and those Athenians who have managed to escape the siege provides the deeper underlying moral lesson that informs and recommends the sound practical and economic advice of someone like David Goldman. For without that moral lesson, absent that moral commitment to personal and political freedom, and lacking the willingness to put one's intelligence and daring in the service of that cause, American ingenuity and innovation will be of little use. Nor will we remain the beacon of freedom, opportunity, and individual flourishing that might affect the brain drain of Chinese talent that Goldman advises us to pursue. Preserving a record of what the Athenian commitment to political freedom can mean for the full development of human nature is, I think, one of the primary aims of a book like Thucydides' History. It's, I also think, one of the primary aims of a place like the Institute of World Politics that continues to teach Thucydides' History. It's my hope that it will continue to do so. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, you mentioned that what is just is what serves their interests. I can see an alignment there with the CCP. Whatever the CCP wants or needs is what you know we like to try to help. And one thing we know is the CCP will not sleep until what they think is the whole of unified China is part of their goals. So you mentioned that we should focus on Taiwan. How can we prevent that? And also, Goldman's idea, I think, is brilliant. Um, but how do you prevent, even though you may innovate better, um, how do you prevent you know, China, China from stealing all that intellectual property and you know, creating a relatively good you know, quality product? Yeah, that, that, I mean, that's, that's huge, right? I mean, one of the, one of the problems America's, uh, and I'm, I'm saying this more secondhand than anything else, I don't want to lay claim to an authority or an expertise I don't possess, but one of the difficulties America faces right now is pre uh, preventing European countries from doing business with China that allows them to then have access to some of the, some of the, uh, the, the, the technology that we uh, America and Western companies have cornered the market on. And once they have that access to that technology, it becomes much easier to kind of uh, reverse engineer, right? Um, 
Well, you might be able to pass laws in America that prevent American companies from doing that, but it's very hard to do that with European countries, right? Who are saying, look, there's a lot of money here, right? We want access to the Chinese market. So that's, that's something that, that has to be kept in mind. Now, you know, Goldman, uh, who has, you know, really kind of much, I mean, I'm taking him at his word here when he says, well, the bigger issue is not so much uh, technological theft, although that is a problem. It's the fact that we're not investing nearly as much as we should be in research and development. Right? Yeah, I mean, technological theft is a problem, but that's not where they're making their hay. That's not where the Chinese are making their hay so much, right? I mean, it's in the, it's in an R&D. It's in the, the emphasis of, uh, you've seen it, they're, they're graduating four times as many STEM uh, PhDs as America is, right? Um, they're seeing a precipitous drop in America of Chinese uh, uh, students coming to, to study science and engineering in America. Why is that? Because the, the students who have come here to study science, engineering, physics, whatever, right, to supercomputing, go back to China and start schools there. So the drop-off we're seeing is suggesting that, that China isn't so much, uh, or rather the, the growth of China that we're seeing is not so much due to them stealing from us as from them imitating and then, and then quadrupling us, right? So. The issue isn't don't you know keep them from stealing our stuff. The issue is can we outproduce them? Can we keep the current edge that we might have in quantum communications or in, in semiconductors that we have? Can we keep that edge? Because if we lose that edge, then we're we're in real trouble. Um, I don't know if you've read Allison's book. Um, I got all as you could tell. I've got all sorts of problems with Allison's book, but reading that first chapter keeps me up at night. I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it almost seems like it's a done deal, right? When I, when I say the day is far spent, it is far spent. We're, we're, we're serious. It's not that China is rising. China's risen, right? And, and it's not about stopping it. It's about, about getting ahead of it. Just, yeah. Uh, if, uh, anyone? Uh, uh, you probably mentioned that the advantage of Athenians was the the uh, ability to innovation, which is the advantage of, if you are made of the whole European culture, which was so. As far as I understand, in China, innovation by itself was never welcome. It was a part of the tradition, but it could be changed easily. However, the new leaderships, particularly the chairman Xi and the president Xi, sorry. Uh, uh, who tries to bring back the communist values, he uh, violated the long existing tradition that no leader could stay in power for yeah. longer than 10 years. Right. All tells us that China, believing that they achieved the, whatever they could achieve, stop, in, stop even trying to do innovations, to bring innovations. Yes, they can still German uh, high speed trains. Yeah and build them as, as many as they would, and Americans would not do this. However, the point is that, um, don't you think, and this is a question, <laughs> don't you think that this is the right moment to talk about, after many, many times when we were, they were predicting doom and gloom and that China is going to collapse, that this is the move that the China reached the point after which it's going to stop its growth? Uh, that, that we've now witnessed the point in which China's going to stop growing? Right. I, you know, um, I've been wrong so many times. I, you know, I, I, fortunately, it's a good thing I'm not a Chinese expert or an expert on Chinese politics because I've been wrong so many times about it. You know, uh, so, so when, you know, 1997, Hong Kong's going to go to China in 50 years, it's, oh, you know, it's, it's, going, to, it's going to democratize China, right? It's going to be the democratic peace movement. The commerce is going to take over. And nope, right? Uh, for years, people have been saying the Chinese economy is overheating and it, it can't maintain the standard of growth. Well, nope, right? It, 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 I mean, even a broken clock is right twice a day. I, I seem to be wrong about the imminent demise of China, so I, I'm reluctant to say we've now seen it. We've now seen it peak. I, I don't see any other aside from something like the aging population. I'm I'm not confident that it's stopped. I don't. I'm not quite sure what. Especially you get the one belt one road initiative that's going on. 
You're seeing the massive investment in infrastructure. Um, you, you know, Allison's quite good about about citing the uh, the states, the stately wisdom of Lee Kuan Yew, who who through his own engagement, you know, with hundreds of Chinese uh, political actors, some at the very highest level, all seem to speak with one voice about the need for the for the world to belong to China. Not that everyone will become Chinese, but that there will be a new Chinese order. The, the, inter, the rules of the international game will be essentially written by China, um, and that we'll all have to basically bow to that, or knuckle under to that, or accept that as reality. Uh, so, look, I mean, I, I, I would love to think that's right. I, I don't, I'm not, con I've been so wrong about the, the imminent demise of the Chinese, you know, economy or the CCP or, you know, um, well, we're seeing, you know, 2014, 2015, we've got democracy protests in Hong Kong. Mainland China doesn't seem to care about that. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not sure uh, we could say, well, you know, they don't really have access to all of this, this news, right? China does a pretty good job of controlling uh, the, the flow of information, state-run media, you name it, their control of social media. Uh, but I'm not sure there would be much traction for something like that anyway. I mean, there seems to be general consensus among the Chinese, and you see it even in Hong Kong too, right? Not everyone in Hong Kong is 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 pro protester, right? You have a sufficient amount of will. So, to just to, again, I, I I'm not confident. I'm not confident that that it's peaked. I would love to agree with you, but I'm. I hope you're right, but I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, in the back, and then we'll move to the front. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Um, I'm curious. Are you suggesting that the U.S. should um, alter the, the current uh, relationship from strategic competitiveness to something more like a, a Cold War kind of situation? Or would you say that we're, we're already there, we just call it something else? Well, I don't want to suggest that we should be competitive with China. It's a question of what we're going to be competitive with, competitive with them in. That's really not good English. Um, when you say Cold War, I mean, the, the strategies that Goldman advocates are drawn from the Cold War because he thought that was largely successful, that we had identified areas of, of our technological supremacy and then were able to expand on them in a way that, that the Soviets simply were not able to ever catch up. And it got to such a point that, that the Soviets realized the game was up. They would never be able to compete with us on these critical areas, especially avionics. It was one, it was a major one. Avionics was, you know, 1982, they realized that American avionics and radar, uh, the radar of its military aircraft were so superior that it basically obviated any superiority they had in uh, surface-to-air missiles, right? It was just, it was done. Game, set, match. So Goldman, and I think he's right here, he said, we got to identify those areas, again, where we possess this kind of critical superiority. I mean, you, you, you know, we're looking at China's mastery in 5G technology. Well, that, are we going to catch up there? Really? Isn't that, isn't, that, uh, isn't that already out, right? Isn't that already done? Um, they, so we have to find those places. Again, he's talking about uh, quantum communication, the kind of encrypted communication that allows you to, to, to communicate massive amounts of data without being hacked. That's an area where we have some kind of superiority. We need to keep that, right? Um, uh, semiconductors, same thing, you know, we still have some supremacy there, but they're catching up, right? Uh, space travel, you know, same thing, We're, we've got superiority there, but they're catching up. Um, you know, uh, uh, aircraft carriers, right? We, we've got 11, they've got two. Yeah, except they, they're they catching up, right? Not only do, through their, their, the development of their, their particular uh, submarines they've now got working outside the coast of China, but also the, uh, the, the, the what is it, the hyper uh, hyper velocity missiles that they have now, uh, the anti-ship, uh, anti-aircraft missiles they have going on there that make it very hard for us to, you know, so, uh, you know, you, I want to say I don't want to. I don't want to stop competing with China. I want to identify areas where we can compete, where we have strategic superiority, and we continue to push that. Here, one, you know, here's one one other piece of evidence that would that would recommend this strategy, and that is right now China is investing a ton of money into what would we would call infrastructure. Okay, so in one belt, one road would be. One of those, one of those uh, initiatives. They're putting a lot of money into infrastructure. 
eventually that's going to become obsolete stuff, right? I mean, it might be, it might be cutting edge technology now. That's great. But eventually that's going to become obsolete. That's going to be a commitment of resources. They won't be able to get back. They're going to be committed to that obsolete technology. So it's all the more important that we continue to develop a research and development. We continue to, I mean, this was, this was, I guess, the kind of crude metaphor I was using from Platea. We got to continue to exercise the ingenuity that's always one step ahead of the Spartan slash Chinese that allows us to get out of that trap that the Spartans had set for the Plataeans. Right? So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if that's, a, if that's a sufficient response, but it's the best I could offer right now. That uh, gentleman right here has been waiting. Oh, last question? All right. Um, uh, you, can, you can ask me afterwards. Yeah, okay. Uh, one of the things that you drew a lot about this song, which I appreciated, was the sort of importance of national character and the culture which was sort of the bedrock of innovation, particularly after Salamis and the sort of the renaissance, if you will. Um, and but one of the things most in particular was that sort of that Athenian sense that, that justice was sort of idyllic and existed outside the interests of the state necessarily. I mean, if, is that a correct characterization? Could you just, could you just repeat that last, last line one more time? Well, part of that sort of uh, renaissance being that the Athenian sense of justice um, was something that is outside the immediate interests of the state that right makes might instead of vice versa. Yeah. Um, given that we know the Athenians it did eventually, I mean, the, the Spartans installed the 30 tyrants, the, the, the Athenians did lose. Is there part of, could you, is there an arc within that sort of culture you see breakdown? You know, I read interpretations of the Middle East debates where Diodotus makes that appeal to self-interest, and that's how he's able to actually stop the massacre. Is there a is part of that arc there? Or? You know, I love the Athenians so much, and every time I read, I've read this book a lot. Um, every time I read it, I think this time they're going to they're going to get it right. <laughs> this time, and then of course, every time I'm disappointed. It's a real testament to Thucydides' artistry that he's able to draw me back in every time and get my hopes up. Um, look, the Athenians, uh, the Athenians are as amazing as they are because they're kind of a, they, there's a dynamism to their soul because they're they're mutually antagonistic elements that are at work. Yeah, I think that's there there's something about them that that wants to leave everything behind and take over the world. Mm -hmm. Because they think they're that good. And they think the world would benefit from it. Uh, at the same time there's another part of them that says, you know, tradition matters, civic virtue matters, the common good matters. And um, so long as those two are kept in a kind of balance, they remain remarkably energetic and powerful. And so from 480 to 431, you see a city that's just, I mean, it's, the, it's one of the greatest flourishings of human ingenuity and talent and, and cultural brilliance that, that we've seen in the West. I mean, okay. Unfortunately, that combination is unstable. And it, it uh, un, uh, ultimately is undone in the direction of individual self-interest. And that's partly because Athens ended up losing some of the leaders that were able to keep it together. And a talented individual like Pericles ends up leaving the scene rather early in the war. And who, who takes over? The nasty, violent, brutal Cleon. And then Alcibiades. And then Nicias. And then it's a big damn mess all over again. Right, so so there is a, a, a trajectory to the Athenian political soul that has its its logical uh, destiny. What civil war and self destruction? And you just all, just to correlate that. You see a lot of Cicero's complaints about the sort of collapse of the Roman Republic, to call it on similar lines, the loss of the sense of where the good truly really lies. Yeah, I mean the problem there with Rome was that it, it, it. I mean, what what kept it great is that it would go out, it would fight, it would win, then it'd go back home. Right? It's when they started to keep the lands they were defeating that you began to, to run into a host of problems, whether it was the fact that you then needed a large standing military, that those militaries were gone for a long time, that you were now incorporating all sorts of non-Roman people into the Roman Republic, and you know, wealth and indulgence began to supplant uh, civic virtue, self-restraint, modesty, public honor, and so on and so forth. Anyway, yeah, no problem. I guess, is that it? <laughs>
Thanks, guys. You were great. I appreciate it.